e já passo direto para a palestra do Dr. Alan Sihoy. O Dr. Alan, ele é cirurgião torácico em Hong Kong, tem uma extensa experiência, em especial com cirurgia minimamente invasiva, é muito ativo em sociedades internacionais e Alan, it's a pleasure having you with us tonight and, and the, the, the stage is yours. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Okay. Uh, thank you so much, everybody. And uh, first of all, I think uh, I, I do have to say uh, warm greetings uh, from Hong Kong to everybody and all these friends in Brazil. It's great to see all of you, even if online. I just want I, I you to know that um, you guys are always in our thoughts and prayers as you go through this difficult time. You have many friends, of course, here in Hong Kong and in Macau, of course. And it's an honor and pleasure for me to share with you tonight. So I've been asked to talk a bit about biosafety and uh, surgeries really as we emerge from this COVID-19 uh, pandemic and certainly we've learned a lot of lessons here in Hong Kong. Uh, these are my disclosures and I think uh, one of them at least the Medela uh, conflict <laughs> I do have to mention because one of their products will turn up later on in this talk. I think I should start this talk really with a, back in 2003 when we actually went through something very similar uh, with SARS uh, and back then in 2003, Hong Kong was the global epicenter of the entire epidemic. And back then we had 22% of all the total cases in the world here in Hong Kong, and 37% of all the total deaths from SARS were in Hong Kong. And that was a big uh, uh, impact on our society. But flash forward 17 years and in COVID-19, this year we've had, uh, we did quite much, quite a lot better. We've contained the uh, uh, spread of the virus in Hong Kong fairly well. We actually have fewer COVID-19 cases than we had SARS cases back in 2003. More importantly, we had far fewer deaths. We had almost 300 deaths in 2003. A lot of them were medical staff. So a lot of the carers on the front line actually ended up dying from SARS. But in 2020 with COVID-19, we only had a total of four deaths. So the situation has much improved. And the lesson from this is that as we emerge from 2020, the current COVID-19 pandemic, we can actually learn a lot of lessons. If there's anything good coming out of this current virus outbreak, is that there are good lessons to be learned. So that whether it's Brazil or the rest of the world, I think next time we face an epidemic like this, we will be much better prepared and uh, we, we can serve our patients much better. So with that in mind, let's have a look at what's happening now. Now, the main danger, of course, in terms of biosafety with COVID-19 is a spread, spread from patient to patient and from patient to staff and even from staff back to patients. Now in the context of the modes of transmission, we all realize today that COVID-19 is spread like most other viruses through droplets and aerosols. And I think what's uh, particularly important in the context of thoracic surgery is that many of the procedures that we do during a thoracic surgery uh, throughout the entire process actually is uh, potentially conducive to uh, uh, the development uh, uh, of, of spread. So we're talking about uh, intubation, bronchoscopy, uh, a lot of the intraoperative procedures. These all potentially can uh, spread the virus uh, around the hospital. Now this can occur preoperatively, intraoperatively, and postoperatively. So it's important for us to actually consider how we can actually intervene at each of these steps in the patient's clinical pathway of thoracic surgery to try and reduce the risk. We can start, of course, with the preoperative stage. And I think what's important here is that we actually have to think about limiting patients coming into hospital where there's most likely a chance of patient to patient and patient to staff spread. Now, the ESTS actually did a survey early on uh, during the pandemic of about 400 surgeons from around the world, thoracic surgeons. And I can see, you can see here on this chart that the majority of uh, responders did say that the, to some extent, if they're seeing a COVID-19 patient, a suspected COVID-19 patients, pa uh, surgery has to be affected. You probably have to delay or even cancel surgery. So there is some impact being recognized. But what exactly is that impact? And I think really the answer is not one size fits all. We do have to consider how the virus is affecting different regions of the world. And we do have to, in some ways, tailor our response uh, 
looking at the situation, uh, how it's affecting us. And certainly we've been very fortunate here in East Asia because we learned from 2003. And you can see here in this particular corner down here, most Asian, East Asian countries actually have managed to contain the virus quite well. And certainly when you've done that, then uh, the impact on thoracic surgery services is a bit less, as we'll see in just a minute. Whereas for the rest of the world, when uh, the virus is already outbreaking in fairly large numbers, then we're not talking about containment anymore. It's, it's actually a situation of mitigation. And how you provide thoracic surgery services for if essential uh, things like lung cancer treatment, esophageal cancer treatment, becomes a different picture. So how we're going to uh, um, uh, uh, design our preoperative uh, protocols according to this? Well, let's start in the uh, top left corner with the mitigation. And I think we can borrow from the experiences in our, from our friends in the United States. And certainly the American College of Surgeons has already recognized the need for triaging and rationing of, thoracic, uh, of surgical services during the pandemic. And they've had this very simple scheme, which I'd just like to share with you, and you've probably seen before. I think there are two elements to this. First is you have to recognize what the actual on the ground situation in your region is. What phase of the pandemic are you in? And they uh, divide that into three phases. Phase one is where you know, the COVID cases are starting to rise. The healthcare system is not yet overwhelmed. Phase two is when you're starting to reach ICU and ventilator capacity limitations. And phase three, of course, is that when you're totally over capacity, it is complete overwhelming. So you have to recognize the setting. The second thing is you have to recognize that uh, diseases should be prioritized. So the different uh, 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 urgency of diseases that need surgery have to be tailored according to the phase of the pandemic. So in phase one, for example, uh, you actually uh, can start limiting your surgery to semi-urgent operations where if you don't do surgery, patients will be affected in the coming few months. As you escalate to phase two, then you're talking about offering surgery for patients who need it really within the next few days. And as you enter phase three, you're talking about the immediately life-saving procedures. So this is the general scheme of things. Of course, as we come down from the pandemic, you can work in reverse, where you're in phase three, you can de-escalate to phase two and phase one. Now, how does this look like in terms of thoracic surgery? So again, our colleagues in the United States, actually the uh, Thoracic Surgery Outcomes Network, a band of our friends in the United States, have already tailored uh, thoracic surgery surgery operations, prioritize it operations according to that same schema we talked about just now, the three phases. So in phase one, just for example, I'll just cut it short, uh, we're talking about offering surgery really to the early stage lung cancers where patients are potentially curable, but if you leave the surgery for too long, uh, then you're missing the opportunity window uh, for treatment. In phase two, you're, uh, here we're talking about uh, surgery that needs to be done within the next few days. You're talking about things like uh, uh, tumor-related complications, where if you don't intervene surgically, patients are expected to die within the next few days. And as you escalate to phase three, then you're limiting all non-emergency surgeries and only treating things that are immediately life-threatening. As you de-escalate from the pandemic, then you can go backwards phase two and phase three. Now, certainly in Asia, uh, as we said just now, we, are, we were very fortunate to be really uh, uh, not overwhelmed by the pandemic. And so our services actually were able to run uh, more or less normally in countries like Korea, Japan, here in Hong Kong and Taiwan, for example. And uh, we're uh, releasing a consensus statement really which should be coming out within the next week or two uh, from the Asian society where after a uh, Delphi process our final recommendations is that really if your uh, uh, services aren't really overwhelmed then thoracic cancer surgery services really can be run maybe with uh, some reserve in case of a, a second wave of viruses coming in. So I think this is a lesson for us to learn as we de-escalate from the current pandemic. This is essentially what I regard as phase zero. Uh, we, can, we can prepare uh, uh, reopening all thoracic surgery services with reduced operating room sessions. We can probably uh, offer surgery for most patients, although if you do need to limit it, you're probably talking about uh, uh, cases which can wait, such as the uh, uh, 
GGO tumors, these can probably wait. So again, I emphasize preoperatively, this is how we're looking at it in terms of the different uh, preparations in different uh, uh, settings of the pandemic. Now, if you are going to offer uh, surgery, then how are you going to offer surgery during the pandemic or the next coming pandemic? Now, I think the first thing uh, to, to uh, consider is the setting of the offering of thoracic surgery. Now in Hong Kong, I'm just showing you our personal experience in Hong Kong, is that we have what we call a dual healthcare system in that uh, there's a good public healthcare system and also a very well-developed private healthcare system. Learning from our lessons in SARS in 2003, we recognized very early on, way back in January, as COVID-19 developed, that all COVID-19 patients could be centralized in the public healthcare systems. The government hospitals already had established infectious disease uh, wards, which could uh, uh, were well equipped to deal with COVID-19. And what this meant is that the private hospitals were able to run essentially completely normal services uh, simply by diverting all COVID-19 patients to the public sector. So we had a parallel system where the private hospitals were able to offer safe surgery, thoracic surgery, to uh, patients going into that system. All patients and also staff going into the private hospitals were carefully screened so that zero suspected cases would enter all our private uh, hospitals in Hong Kong and that the public healthcare system uh, could effectively deal with the COVID-19 patients in uh, specifically. Now, if you don't have this kind of dual healthcare system, or if you're working in a hospital where you do have both COVID and non-COVID-19 patients, then you have to take extra precautions. And again, going back to the American College uh, recommendations, uh, this American college, I think we recognize the same sort of principles all over the world, is that it's important if you're doing uh, this to have dedicated COVID-19 resources. And in terms of thoracic surgery, you do need dedicated COVID-19 operating rooms. This needs to be separated from the uh, uh, normal services so that you can maintain uh, uh, relatively normal services for non-COVID-19 patients. Within the COVID-19 ORs, you of course need separate OR carts, separate from the rest of the uh, uh, surgical cases. Very importantly, I think, is that the staff within the COVID-19 OR during an operation are kept separate from the outside. So you have dedicated runners outside the OR running equipment in and out of the uh, uh, OR to minimize uh, people going in and out of a potentially infected environment. And of course, uh, uh, you avoid intubation in the OR and you have special protective equipment for the uh, COVID-19 uh, OR staff. But more importantly, than, uh, or this is just a schema of, of how this looks overall, but I won't go into the details of that. I think more importantly, I think, uh, is when you prepare for thoracic surgery intraoperatively, then you do have to think about protecting your staff. And PPEs, I think everybody here in the audience will uh, already know the lessons of that. I think you all are very familiar with the different levels of PPE. Back in 2003 with SARS, I think uh, we were tending towards the right side of this, page, uh, this picture. I think for all cases, regardless of whether you have a suspicion of COVID of SARS or not back in 2003, we were donning a lot of protective gear. And certainly with any suspected or confirmed cases, we were going full spacesuit, you know, fully airtight suits with the uh, 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 portable ventilators or backpacks and everything. But I think one of the lessons we learned is if you're able to contain uh, COVID-19 in 2020, I think actually we've actually tended now towards the left side of this picture in that certainly in uh, private hospitals where we're uh, quite confident that we don't have uh, COVID-19 patients coming in, we're operating essentially completely normally as before the pandemic. I think certainly within the public hospitals where you still have suspected COVID-19 cases, I think with the better testing facilities, we now realize that uh, 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 we're able to identify uh, COVID-19 cases much better. And by and large, most patients, even in uh, hospitals with COVID-19 patients, we don't need to go full spacesuit uh, with most of our cases. What's more importantly though, is that we have to identify the specific procedures 
during surgery that are potentially causing uh, transmission of uh, the coronavirus. And uh, I think our anesthetist colleagues are probably ahead of us in this regard. They have uh, many uh, uh, protocols. This is just one example where they identified the different aerosolizing uh, procedures and different measures to prevent uh, spread. And I think especially for anesthetists, things like intubation, suctioning during surgery, these are all very high risk procedures. And it's not surprising that they have very well developed protocols for that. One of the things that uh, we, we do actually routinely do for thoracic surgery in Hong Kong now, after the SARS 2003 epidemic, was this. Every time you uh, intubate any patient, you bag their head. All the intubation, extubation, et cetera, et cetera, is done within a plastic bag. And this is done uh, fairly routinely. So uh, while they're doing this, we as surgeons, of course, exit the operating room. So we're not there exposing ourselves uh, to any potential aerosol uh, uh, spread. But what about surgery itself, not the anesthesia part? What about surgery itself? I think the argument, the debate, I think, in terms of biosafety during surgery comes into two areas. The first area I think a lot of people have a lot of interest is, is the recognition that surgical smoke actually is a potential carrier of a virus uh, droplets. And this especially uh, occurs when we're using energy devices, not only electric cautery, but things like laser and harmonic devices. These potentially release uh, virus droplets into the operating room environment. Now, there is some uh, concern in terms of PPEs about what kind of mask surgeons should be wearing if you're worried about these droplet spreads during surgery. And I think we'll come back to this particular point about masks in just a second. The other aspect that we're debating in terms of viral safety during surgery is the surgical approach. Does this make a difference? Does it make a difference if you're using open surgery, VATS, or I think here in the audience, robotic surgery, does that increase or decrease your safety levels in terms of uh, thoracic operations during the pandemic? Now, to answer this, I think we can consider some of the guidelines that are being presented. And I think the first guideline, I think which caused a lot of debate in Europe and certainly in Asia was this, the uh, conjoint colleges of surgeons in the United Kingdom actually released these guidance, uh, guidelines in April. And they specifically said that laparoscopy, minimally invasive surgery, is considered to carry higher risk. And in fact, a lot of the thoracic surgeons in the UK actually for a time were avoiding VATS altogether. Now, is this justified or not? Now, in terms of general surgery, as we recognize, laparoscopy almost inevitably uh, in, uh, includes use of carbon dioxide insufflation. And that was the reason given that uh, for increased risk. With VATS, and certainly with rats, we don't actually use carbon dioxide so much. So perhaps this is probably a bit less of a concern. Now, uh, the counter argument to that was from our friends in America, uh, the SAGE group, the gastroenterology surgeons, who actually had a completely opposite view. And in terms of surgical approaches, they actually say that the small, smaller wounds are actually better. It makes sense because if you don't have a big open wound, then potentially you're having less access for any created surgical smoke to escape into the operating room environment. They do, however, caution that if you are using CO2, you should keep the pressure to a minimum. And if you are using electrosurgery or energy devices, you should use the lowest possible settings. So there's an ongoing debate. And I, but I think the, uh, the argument, the debate is swinging towards the fate in favor of minimally invasive surgery in a pandemic environment. And certainly going back to our consensus statement in Asia, we, we uh, in Asia recognize that actually the evidence doesn't point either way. And there's probably no specific difference in terms of surgical approaches. We'll come back to this in a minute. There is a potential advantage of using minimally invasive surgery. More importantly, I think, uh, is to identify, as I said, the high-risk uh, intraoperative procedures, things like using bronchoscopy throughout your surgery, cross-jet uh, cross-field uh, ventilation during sleeve resections, for example, or, or, or tracheal resections, uh, excessive suctioning during surgery, etc. These should probably be reduced or avoided. 
Uh, I should also mention that one of the things we noted in Asia is that a lot of uh, our European friends discharge patients home with a chest strain. In Asia, this was never the practice. And specifically in the pandemic environment, we discourage this. I think what we don't want is a patient going home with a chest strain, potentially infecting the community. And we'll come back to this chest strain issue in just a second. Another part of our consensus is that we recognize that uh, when selecting patients for surgery, we want to select patients with a lower likelihood of ICU admissions or prolonged hospital stay. And this was initially really a, a reflection that we didn't want to overwhelm our uh, services in the hospital. But if you really think about it, it also makes sense that you don't want patients hanging around in a hospital environment after surgery because you're exposing that patient to the potential of cross-infection of a, a virus. And also, if the patient himself has a virus, you don't want him or her uh, spreading virus to staff or to other patients. And that's another reason why I think in Asia, we tend to favor minimally invasive surgery. Because if you can get your patients home sooner, then potentially you're exposing the risk of the patient and the staff. You're, you're reducing that exposure to risk. Now, uh, in terms of hospital stay postoperatively, what are the risks? And one of the thing, key things that's being identified around the world now is this chest drainage. Um, because postoperatively, if a patient has an air leak and uh, the, it's carry, the air leak itself has a potential of carrying virus laden droplets, and as that air leak escapes out into the chest drain, as it bubbles through these water seals, then there is a theoretical risk that you're creating extra aerosols and droplets, which in a traditional water seal system would escape directly into the atmosphere. And that is a source of concern for some thoracic surgeons around the world. Now, is this concern real or is it just imagined? Now, we can, uh, well, there's actually no good uh, hard evidence for that so far, but at least anecdotal reports like this have been uh, mentioned across the internet. This is actually from our friends in London, and they actually observe that in their unit, they did have a, a, patient, a, a patient with a prolonged air leak after surgery who was subsequently found to be COVID-19 positive. And subsequently in that ward, after a patient was discharged, a number of patients on that same ward tested positive for COVID-19. Now, I stress that this is not a peer-reviewed article, so I don't know how good the evidence is, but there are anecdotal reports of this emerging around the world. And another thing we can, uh, uh, make reference to is back in 2003 in SARS, one of the many outbreaks we had in Hong Kong occurred in this housing estate called Amoy Gardens. And what happened was a patient with SARS back then went to the toilet. And when he flushed the toilet, his waste got aerosolized. And you can see the sewage tubes outside the buildings actually link all the units up and down in that same building. And the aerosol spread upwards through the sewers into the toilets of other apartment users in that same building. And that caused a mini outbreak. Now, if you can imagine this YouTube in the, sew uh, in the toilets being similar to the uh, water seal in your chest drain, if it, if it can occur between apartment blocks, you can imagine that this sort of thing can occur within a ward with patients with water seal chest strains. So there is a theoretical risk of spreading virus uh, if you have a virus COVID-19 patient on your ward. So what can we do to ameliorate this risk? Well, uh, I came across this paper. I think a lot of you probably have read this already. If you haven't, you should. I think this is a pretty nice paper from our trauma surgeon colleagues in America. And they offered four suggestions, which I thought were quite reasonable. The first thing here on the left is very simple. If you're using a water seal uh, system, put some bleach into that water seal. Very simple to do, and you're killing off the virus safely, effectively, and quite cheaply. The second thing to do is actually advise connect the patients to suction. Because when you connect the patient to suction, then any air leak that's coming out doesn't go into the outside atmosphere, it goes into the wall. And more importantly, you fit in a viral filter between the chest strain and your wall suction, and there you go. You have a closed system that's quite safe. If you don't want to use suction, then you can actually put a viral filter onto the end of the uh, air outlet, and again, you're reducing the risk. 
the viral filter, I don't know how available that is in Brazil. In Asia, in most parts of Asia, we don't have this. So we'll come to another solution in a minute. The final uh, suggestion they have, again, this is brilliant. Use cable ties on all the connections on your chest train. So this uh, reduces uh, leakage around the connections, and more importantly, it stops accidental uh, disconnection and release the virus into the atmosphere. So this is a nice, simple suggestion. Now, I mentioned just now that uh, these viral filters are not necessarily available in all places around the world. So one of the alternatives that are being suggested is the use of these digital chest train systems. Now, one of the beauties of these digital chest train systems is that they already come with a filter in the reservoir. So this is how it actually looks like. This is a drain coming out of the patient. Uh, uh, the air actually uh, goes into the reservoir and before it returns into the system and gets ejected into the atmosphere, it goes through a filter. Now this is actually not a viral filter. It's a bacterial filter. Does it work for viruses? Now, if you actually look at the size of viruses, viruses are tiny compared to bacteria, as we all know. The uh, SARS virus, the coronavirus, is essentially a medium-sized uh, virus, but it's still smaller than the pores in a bacterial filter. And some people would say that really a bacterial filter won't work so well for viruses. But that's in theory. In practice, the picture might be slightly different. Now, we can actually make reference to this particular paper, which my colleagues here in Hong Kong uh, published in Nature Medicine just a couple of months ago, and specifically looking at the use of surgical masks, which are essentially the same filtration level as most bacterial filters, not a viral filter, a bacterial filter. And if you just use a surgical mask uh, uh, on, on breathing, you can see that it can actually effectively reduce the risk of spread in terms of droplets and aerosols of coronavirus. So there's some evidence that you don't actually always necessarily need to go all the way to a viral filter. Uh, Medela themselves actually conducted a, uh, a, a laboratory test uh, using a very simple setup. They use uh, virus-laden uh, suspensions. They put it through a filter with a vacuum pump on the other end. And they actually found that actually using a uh, uh, just a bacterial filter, a bacterial, not a viral filter, they were able to uh, have a very good retention rate, even for viruses down to the size of hepatitis A, which is considerably smaller than a coronavirus. So there's some uh, emerging evidence that any kind of bacterial filter is better than no filter whatsoever. So the final word goes to the British Thoracic Society, which actually uh, uh, issued these guidelines for chest strain management. I think uh, if you're going to use a chest strain, ideally connect it to a wall suction, create a closed system. Ideally install a viral filter if, you, if that's available and you can have it. But if you don't have it, then certainly a, a something like a digital chest strain circuit, a bacterial filter is better than nothing. Uh, they don't contain a viral filter, but there's emerging evidence that maybe they might be of some use. So I'm just going to bring my rather long talk to a close. I think what I really want, want to say is that if you're going to uh, perform thoracic surgery in the post-COVID-19 era, think preoperatively how you can define different settings of the pandemic and therefore how you can define different priorities of diseases that you're going to be uh, offering surgery for in the different settings, in the different phases, uh, and this is something we can prepare for. Intraoperatively, prepare your OR strategy. Are you going to categorize hospitals as COVID-19 or non-COVID-19 hospitals? In the COVID-19 hospital, how are you going to prepare an OR uh, uh, in order to allow ongoing non-COVID-19 surgery? Identify and prepare for high-risk procedures. Minimize surgical smoke. Uh, perhaps really through a minimally invasive surgery, reducing uh, CO2 insufflation, et cetera. Postoperatively, ideally you want to shorten the overall length of stay, reduce the risk exposure of patients and staff to potential uh, transmission, and identify uh, hazards such as chest strains with air leaks, and you try and find ways of reducing the transmission through chest strains. So with that, I'd like to bring my talk to a close. Thank you very, very much.